Welcome back. We're talking about the global push against climate change. Joining us from New York, Jean Pascal Vanny Percel. He's vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Also, in New York, environmental activist Xi Ping Lo. He's the CEO of the World Wildlife Fund China. Uh, Xi Ping Lo, let me begin with you. What has been the impact of uh, climate change on China, and what is China doing to change things mm -hmm. around? Well, in recent years, we see an intensification of uh, climate change impact in China. Uh, we have stronger, more frequent uh, typhoons. We have longer and more synchronized droughts across the country. We have uh, a observable uh, change of uh, rainfall pattern. Uh, in some places, we have very, very heavy rainfall in a very short time, short period of time. Um, we have extreme uh, cold weather event uh, and heat waves uh, in different parts of the year. Um, it is very observable that climate change is taking a hit in China. Um, the top leaders in China are quite aware of the problem and have been taking uh, quite encouraging measures okay. to uh, address the root cause of climate change, um, which is um, uh, human uh, emission uh, of CO2 to the atmos uh, emi uh, carbon emission to the atmosphere by human activities. Um, so we see a lot of pilots of low carbon city development in China. We see the um, widespread um, construction of uh, uh, high speed well train, uh, railway train. Uh, we see um, very uh, strong efforts in. Uh, controlling the emission of um, uh, CO2 from the electricity sector and recently uh, also uh, onto the um, steel and cement sector. Uh, the challenge is huge. Uh, China is still uh, on a rapid uh, development pathway, um, but we see that uh, there are positive signs the government is taking it seriously. Can you give us some specific steps the Chinese government is taking to tackle this problem? Well. Um, just uh, last Friday, the government announced the 2020 uh, climate change uh, strategy, national strategy, um, in which it talks about uh, China will put a cap, uh, coal consumption cap on industrial sectors such as steel and cement. Uh, these two sectors are uh, major uh, emitter of uh, CO2, greenhouse gas. Um, there are also discussion about uh, putting a national coal cap uh, in the electricity sector. Um, the government is also putting a uh, objective of uh, reduction of carbon intensity uh, by 2020 uh, of 45 percent. Uh, we also have a very ambitious uh, renewable energy target set by the government, uh, 15 percent of non-fossil fuel in the primary energy mix uh, by 2020. Uh, these are very um, encouraging efforts by the authority. All right, let me move on to Jean Pascal. You've been studying climate change for a number of years. In your opinion, what's changed in the past decade? Well, I think the awareness about the problem has significantly increased, and that's because the impacts of, uh, that's mostly because the impacts of climate change uh, have become more visible for everybody to see. Uh, so the, um, the, the, the challenge is, is much more visible now than it was 10 years ago. Uh, now the action is not uh, at, the, uh, at the level uh, of the, the challenge, but uh, the awareness is much higher. Jean Pascal, Jose Manuel Barroso, president of the European Commission, told the UN Climate Summit just a few days ago the European Union will cut its gas emissions 80 percent to 95 by the year 2050. How will the EU do that? Well, I'm not sure the EU uh, has a plan, uh, a detailed plan to achieve that, but what has uh, been done already is uh, uh, a big step on that way because on, uh, right now the, uh, the Kyoto objective have been um, more than met by the EU and the plan is by 2030 to uh, cut emissions by 40 percent, for example. Uh, and uh, it's by a number of measures. I mean, there are 
uh, putting a, a trading system for uh, CO2 quotas in place between big uh, polluters. They've uh, reinforced energy, energy standards, energy efficiency standards. They've uh, talked to car manufacturers. They're, they're trying to work with airlines as well. So they've done a number, the number of, uh, they've taken a number of steps and they certainly intend to take more but it would be better to ask them. It's not for the IPCC to know exactly how the uh, EU is going to reach its uh, targets. Asiping Lo, let me move to you. Um, are there lessons the United States can learn from China in this area and vice versa? Well, I think China has been learning a lot from uh, the United States. Uh, for example, um, the, you know, how are we going to regulate CO2 as a pollutant? I mean, there's a lot for China to learn from the United States. Um, the application of renewables, uh, uh, wind farms were uh, built in the U.S. much earlier than in China, uh, but China is also putting it in a much quicker scale. Uh, right now, the installed capacity in China uh, is doubling almost every year since the last decade. And China also become the number one uh, solar PV uh, producer of the world. Um, on the other hand, I think um, there are also things that United States can uh, maybe uh, learn from China, uh, such as um, uh, in uh, providing uh, more accessible uh, public transport system for big cities and also for intercity uh, transport. Um, I'm aware that there has been a uh, discussion about whether um, the um, high-speed trains should be built in California, for example. If you go to China right now, um, there are high-speed trains connecting uh, major cities across the country. Uh, I think there are, there, the, these measures would uh, uh, enormously help to uh, reduce emission while not affecting uh, people's uh, mobility and uh, economic activities. Uh, I, I think two the two governments can learn so much from each other. Uh, Jean-Pascal, I have a question to ask you, and then I'd like to pose my final question to both of you. Um, what happens globally if we do not get climate change under control? Well, you know, the, um, the IPCC projections, if we uh, don't curb uh, emissions uh, very significantly in the next decades, uh, show a warming by the end of the century that could reach five or six degrees uh, Celsius above the pre-industrial level. And that is a huge change. It's as much as the change that took place about 10,000 years ago between the glaciated uh, stage uh, when three kilometers of, of ice were on, on uh, North America and Northern Europe uh, and the present stage, which has been uh, stable for the last 10,000 years. So it would, it's really a climate that would be completely different. It means that agriculture uh, could not take place in the same way, it would be seriously affected. That health uh, would be affected by heat waves, droughts, floods, etc. That infrastructure would be uh, damaged by sea level rise because sea level uh, are rising as well. They have increased by 20 centimeters already globally, and they would increase in the uh, in the highest um, in the highest value by something like uh, 60 to 80 centimeters by the end of the century. So it's it's really the habitability of the whole planet which is at stake. Uh, and this is why uh, it's really important to uh, maintain the temperature under a warming of two degrees as decided by the leaders in Copenhagen in 2009. All right, so let me ask my final question. I'm posing this to both of you. It seems there's so much going on around the world. We're fighting Ebola, the crisis in Iraq, fighting terrorism, Syria. How can we make climate change and the issue of global warming a priority? Siping Lo, I will begin with you. Well, I think um, the People's March in New York with more than 400,000 people uh, coming from across the uh, USA, but also from different parts of the world, from all walks of life, make it clear that there is a rising awareness from the population, from the citizens, that we need to take urgent climate actions. The science is clear, as um, shown by IPCC report. Um, we, what we are lacking right now is uh, perhaps the political will from the leaders of the world, whether we can get our acts together. Um, business leader is supporting it, uh, as we hear from the uh, 
uh, announcements uh, during the climate summit. A lot of business leaders are willing to take actions and also putting money on the table. The civil society is behind it, the scientists is behind it. What we are really lacking is well leaders' political determination. Jean-Pascal, do you agree it's political will that's really needed here? Well, that's the, um, you know, unwritten secret content of the IPCC reports, because the IPCC reports diagnosed the problem very well, but they also sh have shown uh, in, in hundreds of pages that the elements of solutions were known, I mean, from the technology point of view, from the economic point of view, from the uh, um, analysis of social behaviors point of view, and, and what is lacking is the will the political will to implement uh, those uh, those measures, which could which could address the the problem, which, by the way, is it also not only but also a threat multiplier because it it multiplies the impact. It facilitates some of the um, uh, events that you you mentioned at the beginning by promoting. Uh, you know, migrations uh, affecting food security, and and uh, there are interrelationship between uh, some of these problems. And so, fighting climate change should become a priority, uh, and it would help addressing the other problems that the world has as well. All right, thank you so much, gentlemen. Xi Pinglo, Jean Pascal, Vani Percel, thank you for your thoughts and perspective. And that's all we have time for, but the conversation continues online. Join us on CCTV America's Facebook page to comment on this show or any show or chat with us on Twitter at CCTV America. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time.